This is Radioactive, a grassroots environmental and social justice news journal for February 19th, 2015. Today we talk with Penobscot Nation Chief Kirk Francis about the Environmental Protection Agency's new directive to the state of Maine to strengthen water quality standards for tribal waters. And we look again at the fast-moving and legally controversial resurgence of legislation aimed at relaxing Maine's metallic mining regulations. On February 2nd, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency issued a decision that the state of Maine's water quality standards are not stringent enough in tribal waters. The state has been asked to strengthen these standards in compliance with protection of tribal sustenance fishing rights under the Federal Clean Water Act. This month's EPA decision came in response to the state of Maine's recent lawsuit against the EPA in an attempt to declare tribal water quality the jurisdiction of the state and not the federal government. The water quality of other federally recognized tribes within the United States has been a federal responsibility. This based on the now legal responsibilities of the federal government to uphold certain standards on behalf of the tribes. The 1980 Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act, while making progress in some areas of tribal state relations, has proved in the decades since to muddy these relations greatly, with the state claiming that the tribes have given up certain rights, particularly to do with water and fisheries, while many other analysts and the tribes saying that state claims are unwritten in the act and were not the intent of the act. This month's EPA decision did allow that the state of Maine can oversee water quality standards for tribal waters, but it must adhere to the Federal Clean Water Act and increase the protectiveness of these standards in relation to tribal sustenance fishing. While the tribes welcome this recognition of the importance of their water quality, the state of Maine has been pushing hard in the other direction. In 2012, the state began action to disassociate the water flowing through the Penobscot Nation from tribal control. In response, the Penobscot Nation is now suing the Maine Attorney General over this matter, which we'll cover again in greater detail on future programs. Maine's attorney from Pierce Atwood, Matt Manahan, has gone on the PR offensive in both the Penobscot River case and in the new EPA water quality decision. The Bangor Daily News quotes his accusations extensively in a February 12th article. Manahan claims erroneously that the EPA decision will affect far beyond the scope of its purview, stating the decision will affect every permitted discharger along the river or its tributaries. The EPA has stated the decision may affect some upstream dischargers, but the waters in the regulations are those within tribal reservations and trust lands. Here to speak with us today on this new decision and other related matters is Penobscot Nation Chief Kirk Francis. Welcome back to the program, Chief Francis. Oh, it's great to be back and always good to talk to you and appreciate the opportunity. Great. Well, last time we had you on the program, we were talking about similar issues of water quality and jurisdiction in tribal waters. Within this issue, there are obviously many currently unfolding legal and regulatory aspects. But today we want to talk about the newest development, the February 2nd decision by the Federal Environmental Protection Agency that has determined that the state's water quality standards are not protective enough for tribal waters in Maine under the Clean Water Act. So we're going to later give you a chance to respond to um, the numerous public comments that the state's lawyer, Manahan, has has made in the Bangor Daily and other places. But, But first, let's talk about the significance of this decision and your response, what's included in this decision and what it means for the Penobscot Nation and for, for tribes in Maine. Great, yeah, and, and again, you know, we're um, extremely, obviously, excited about the level of conversation that has taken place around this issue, and also um, EPA's uh, support and the federal trust relationship with the Penobscot Nation, and it also um, takes it very seriously, their responsibility to protect Indian tribes, and especially around these core cultural issues and, you know, and I think what the EPA's decision does in our um, response to that really shows the credibility of the tribe's arguments. I mean, what we're saying here is if you look at the decision, the decision says, yes, state of Maine, you have the authority to implement water quality standards statewide. However, 
you must recognize within Indian Territory the tribal subsistence lifestyle and your water quality standards have to be conducive to that. And that is historic, really, in terms of um, recognizing as a determinant factor um, tribal subsistence rights within the Clean Water Act and how states have to abide by that. Uh, This is, we think, one of the first times, if not the first time, EPA has come to this kind of decision in terms of... um, its mandates to states in recognition of uh, of tribal rights within um, their territories. So, so the the decision really is uh, twofold. One, the, the the decision was that Maine has the authority, and second, however, as the trustee for the tribe, we are going to mandate under the Clean Water Act that you recognize the tribe's subsistence and sustenance based lifestyle and uh, fishing rights within those territories. So. So truly historic decision, and we're extremely proud of it. Our, our end goal is never about who controls what. It's really about um, are we getting to a place where there's a product that truly recognizes and protects our people to be who we are for future generations, and that's um, what the EPA has done here, and we couldn't be happier. And again, we're talking about the waters that flow through tribal um, trust lands or tribal reservations and trust lands. There's, I think, misinformation out, out there about what waters this applies to. And obviously, there's some contention legally, but it seems pretty clear from the tribe's use up until now, what are tribal waters and what are the waters that affect the health and sustenance fishing of, of the tribes. But can you talk a little bit about what waters come under this uh, this ruling? Sure. You know, of course. You know all of the uh, the waters within our trust territories and in our reservation territory. So you know, obviously, the Department of Interior has recognized uh, through formal opinions that uh, the main stem of the Penobscot River is part of and runs through the reservation, and so that's uh, obviously an important body of water to the Penobscot people. It's at the very core of our cultural identity, and uh, very very important to us that. The cultural practices that come along with the relationship with this river uh, remain intact and at a very high level. So, um, in the EPA's decision, they they have you know kind of defined you know where these waters are um, in alignment with definitions from the Settlement Act, etc. Mm-hmm. And also, um, you know, obviously with within our reservation, which includes the river. So we're um, Again, extremely excited about that, about our ability to fulfill our responsibility to this place and and to do that in partnership with our federal partners to make sure that um, not only a lifestyle and a cultural identity remains intact, but also that those practices are conducive to the health of our people. And that's the big thing is the human health criteria that is... Um, extremely important in any sustenance-based lifestyle. And to elaborate that a little more, um, talk about the importance of the river of sustenance fishing to the tribe and the struggles that the tribe has had uh, over the years with the issue of water quality. Mm -hmm. So, you know, as as most people know, um, you know, the Penobscot people have lived on this river for thousands of years. It's the very center of our spiritual, cultural, and, and physical existence. And, and uh, in that sustenance-based lifestyle from the river is extremely important to the identity of our people going forward. And, you know, Maine's application to, to the EPA to administer water quality standards within Penobscot waters under the Clean Water Act presents a very real threat to Penobscot people. I mean, it's, um, it's under this oversight that for over a century, this river was degraded to, a, to basically a toxic waste dump. And we had dioxin levels that were off the charts. We had dealt with phosphorus overloads and just the irresponsibility within the river that has created a situation where even today, um, pregnant women cannot eat fish from the river. Um, healthy adults can have one small meal a month. That's a state advisory on fish consumption within the Penobscot River. So um, that has a real effect on our um, ability 
to exist as the Penobscot people always have. And, and so, um, and you know, when you couple that with the inability to live in some form or fashion, um, off the resources from the river and, uh, practice a cultural based lifestyle, um, this, in my mind, in a lot of other people's minds, and the science proves that, has created the disparities we see in diabetes and heart disease and cancer, a whole host of things that Native people in Maine are dealing with today. In many cases, in some cases, four to five times higher than the average American. So more recently, you know, Maine has taken the position in our case, as you know, that the reservation does not include the river. Mm-hmm. And under this view, we have no sustenance fishing right in the waters that surround us. So, you know, we're really under attack in multiple ways. And we believe it's a termination attempt by the state of Maine um, by removing us from our from our cultural connection to the river and also um, taking away our in an attempt to take away our identity as well through these actions. So. Maine has always been aligned with the pollution dischargers. The Penobscot Nation has no monetary gain by increased water quality standards to improve our environment and access and uh, elevation of our cultural identity. We have nothing to gain but those things, clean water, cultural integrity. And, uh, And that's all we're talking about. We're not talking about developing on the river. We're not talking about you know, needing control for whatever purpose. So we're, we're really about those things. And I think this decision and our reaction to that shows that. We're not saying, well, we're disappointed because we don't have total authority and control over this. That's not our goal and objective. Our goal and objective is to make sure that the things we're fighting for, for an end result, an end product, are actually what happens. And I don't care if that's Maine DEP, if it's... Um, the EPA or if it's us, it it needs to happen. Mm-hmm. And uh, the state of Maine has proven that they're not going to recognize that. So in this case, we're elated that the EPA is going to step in those roles as the trustee for the tribe and, uh, and hold Maine to fulfilling that obligation to ensuring that they're not culturally separating a people from its territory. And so this is why we fought so hard over the years. You can go back 12 years to the to the delegation on wastewater discharge and that whole fight that took place. Mm-hmm. What we've proven through a over decade long EPA contamination study that was recently released through um, a whole host of things that our interest was never going to be protected under that condition. So the state of Maine views that the the tribes have very little rights and that they have all the authority and they're gonna um their only criteria for dealing with uh, clean water is meeting a minimum standard under the clean water act that doesn't protect the subsistence-based lifestyle of anyone so you know the epa has shown that it fully supports and understands the importance of this river and identity to our people and we just could not be happier with uh, with that decision and also with the bright future we see for this uh, great river. So um, with that coupled with the river restoration project and a whole host of other things we're participating in um, to bring recreation and cultural-based tourism and a whole host of things to this area, as well as an extremely vibrant fishery that, uh, that once existed here, um, we're of the firm belief that will exist again. So what that decision really, really did was give this tribe a whole lot of hope for the future. And um, I'm not sure you can really quantify what that has meant to people over the last few weeks here. This is Radioactive on WERU. We're speaking with Penobscot Nation Chief Kirk Francis. So again, the Environmental Protection Agency handing down a decision that sustenance fishing practices must be protected under the Clean Water Act for waters flowing through tribal lands within the state boundaries. Um, That ruling, as we understand it, has directed the state to come up with new, more protective regulations for those waters 90 days from February 2nd, or to come up with the changes or to respond to the request? Yeah, so it it has to, uh, 
respond to the EPA on um, on the decision and, and what they're going to do to meet those standards, and and um, they have 90 days to do so, and and so we'll have to wait and see as to how they respond. We wanted to hear your perspective, particularly all the positive aspects that it that um, it means for the Penobscot Nation and other tribes within Maine, um, the state of Maine boundaries, but we also want to give you the opportunity to respond to um, a lot of the state's response to this um, to this decision. And we're mostly hearing it through their lawyer from Pierce Atwood, Matthew Manahan, who um, had a, a lot to say in the latest Bangor Daily News article at February 12th, where the headline is uh, taking a different tact. EPA water quality ruling may cost towns millions. And it starts out with uh, Manahan's perspective. If federal regulators follow through with their mandate, it could result in towns and others with discharge permits each having to spend millions of dollars on upgrades within the next five years. And we should say in in the court case that the tribe has with the Attorney General's office, Maine Attorney General's office, Manahan has managed to get 18 municipalities up and down the Penobscot River to sign on to the case um, from Bucksport to Millinocket with the impression that they would be affected by decisions like that were just made right now. Can you can you talk about uh, that mistruth, really, of who will be affected and um, this kind of really scare tactics that we've been seeing Manahan um, apply during this whole period? Yeah, you know, I think, um, you know, I've never met Mr. Manahan, and, you know, he's certainly entitled to his opinion, and but they're factually just wrong. And I mean, you, most of the interveners in the Penobscot Nation versus Mills case are downstream discharge sites from the reservation. They're out of the geographical location of the case itself. And uh, that case has nothing to do with discharge sites. Or That is about the state of Maine taking the position that we don't have a sustenance-based right within the river. That's all it is. And that's all that case is about. However, it makes for great atmosphere to run around and say, you know, the big bad Penobscot Nation is trying to take your land and trying to um, put burdens on municipalities and trying to do all these things. When even if for some reason the court came back and said, not only do they have a sustenance fishing right, they have total control of everything within the entire river river system. Uh, the main stem of the Penobscot. Um, this would have no effect on over half of the clients he's convinced to come in this case. And uh, I think it's a real shame uh, that you cannot make the legal arguments on what the... And all people have to do is go and look at our very first filing. Look at our amended complaint. Look at what we've been saying from the very beginning. This was an aggression by the state of Maine's with a simple one-paragraph letter in 2012 that said, "Eh, despite former attorney general opinions and despite the fact you've always been there, we don't think you have any rights there. Not even a recognition of common law riparian rights. What were we supposed to do? We had to defend ourselves, so that's what we did. And um, this case had nothing to do with municipalities. It has nothing to do with us trying to take over um, and permit and people out of existence in the river. It's it's a scare tactic to change the atmosphere. There's not much atmosphere, atmospheric sympathy to their argument to say simply, we just don't think they have a sustenance-based fishing right, and that's what we're going to fight on. Um, that doesn't look great for them, so they have to start creating this atmosphere that that we're trying to hurt others. And, and the PR campaign, if you look at the land claims, you look at any um, contentious situations we've been in with the state, it's always been the same approach. You know, the United States is coming in, they're going to help the tribes, um, you know, hurt people up and down the river. And it's just the furthest thing from the truth. And I just think it's irresponsible for a for an attorney of record to, in this case, to be running around and saying things that are factually untrue that incite 
racism, they incite um, anger, and it um, and it doesn't and it cheats Maine citizens. I mean, no matter where you are on the issue, you should at least be entitled to fair and accurate information on what is exactly going on. And again, to to re-articulate the EPA's decision on upholding water quality within tribal waters, they've said that we're talking about waters within tribal reservations and trust lands. We're not talking about waters upstream or downstream, though it could possibly affect upstream discharges. But Manahan was also quoted in the Bangor Daily News saying, the ruling has the potential to affect every permitted discharger along the river or its tributaries because of the ability of fish to swim upstream or downstream into tribal waters. It goes on. Again, I just wanted to to add that part where we have these two um, completely opposing viewpoints, or or rather the EPA decision and then Manahan's interpretation of it. And so I think, you know, obviously the old saying goes, you can't really convince people who are paid not to be convinced. And I think that... um, (laughs) The bottom line is he understands better than that the technical aspects of this. What there are mixing zones, there are a whole host of technical stuff that smarter people than me can certainly answer much better. But I think that um, he understands that the sky's not falling here, that uh, Maine's not just going to fall into the ocean because somehow we need cleaner water within uh, reservation territories and in tribal lands, he he fails to mention that, you know, the tribe has never one time imposed its will on any municipality or any person that was trying to access the Penobscot River. The only thing that this tribe has ever done is try to manage its exclusive sustenance right to trap, hunt, and fish in a way that is conducive to productive science. So, you know, these small permits that were required when you're killing animals within the Penobscot River um, were basically about um, understanding the level of pressure, the effects of that on a sustenance resource, and how we could productively manage that for all all citizens, quite frankly, because we've never denied anyone access. So, um, and then all of a sudden now, you know, if we go back to 2011, it, the sky's going to fall, and this could have potential impacts all over, um, all throughout the river system. It's just a scare tactic to, quite frankly, I, I, I just think that he is uh, making a lot of people spend a lot of money in this case that really um, should not be. And I can't control that. I can't control how um, he messages, but I know that it, I feel it's irresponsible and it's harmful to tribal citizens and state citizens when uh, the debate is not on the facts. You know, we understand totally that we are in a coexisting society, that we have to find common ground. Every municipality along the river and every person that lives on the river has an interest, and we have to figure that out. All we're saying is that the distinct cultural people that live within this territory, the cultural practices that come along with that and its ability to remain Penobscot for generations to come has to be recognized in a way that is conducive to that growth. So, um, you know, they will, they like to, to turn things into, um, you know, that this is about control and this is about the tribe trying to, um, impose its will on on everyone up and down the river and the the reality is that that's just not the case and and quite frankly you know i don't even think that the tribe um from a philosophical standpoint even has had that thought for for a brief moment i mean what what the tribe has said is um we need our way of life protected and your activity and your behavior is threatening that and so um you know, he's an attorney for the other side. He has to, I guess, create the atmosphere he creates. But at the end of the day, we know that hundreds of Maine citizens um, are starting to weigh in. They're, we're getting calls. We're getting um, letters. We're getting um, all kinds of requests to speak uh, because 
they understand that um, this state fight with Maine's Indian tribes is not on behalf of Maine citizens. It's not about the tribe in the state um, in terms of its peoples. It's about two governments that um, have totally different philosophies and approaches trying to find common ground with the refusal on one side to even allow the tribes to be at the table. And so, you know, we often see, um, you know, this approach in terms of, you know, one swipe of the pen, they go 10,000 years worth of rights, you know, right out the window. And we just can't stand by and let that happen. So, I, I you know, with the EPA decision, I think what it says loud and clear is these tribes have federal protections. You're not just going to legislate them out of existence. And you're certainly not just going to make uh, administrative decisions based on opinions to... Uh, uh, to separate them from, and alienate them from their territory, all things they are fully protected by under federal law. And, uh, and you know, we just, like I said, we, we couldn't thank the EPA enough for taking their trust responsibility very seriously. And also there are just mounds of consultation and uh, oversight of this issue because, you know, one thing the state can't say is that they weren't reached out to. Uh, the EPA exhausts an extensive consultation process before they make any decisions, and um, and the refusal to compromise uh, even a little bit is um, is really legendary on that side. And I think you know every agency throughout the federal system is starting to understand uh, the real problem that exists here in Maine between state and tribal governments. So DEP's Patricia Aho's response that she was shocked and stunned is is not necessarily accurate. Then she was quite aware of these these efforts. Well, I mean, I don't, you know, to be fair to her, I don't know that uh, DEPA was saying in great detail. This is because we didn't know in any great detail. Okay. We knew, um, you know, that the EPA was working on this issue. And we have to remember the tribe really was not involved in this fight, only to the extent that um, you know, we have real concerns about the water quality around uh, our sustenance-based territories. This was the state of Maine suing the EPA because the EPA almost two years ago came out with a, or over a year ago, came out with a ruling that said your water quality standards are approved except for Indian Territory. And the state immediately sued uh, because they wanted it clarified that they applied in Indian Territory as well. So, uh, so that's how we got to this decision. And what they said was, yeah, you know, statutorily, um, you probably do have the authority to implement it statewide, but you're going to recognize some things in certain areas that are extremely important and, and are under federal protection. So um, so we're, we're pleased that that, that, that uh, conversation is taking place and that that, uh, that that thought process is at the highest levels of the federal government and that um, for the first time, EPA is saying these are uh, determining factors under the Clean Water Act and you've got to recognize them. This is Radioactive on WERU. We're speaking with Penobscot Nation Chief Kirk Francis. Also in the Bangor Daily article, Manahan says that the 1980 Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act explicitly states that water quality standards will be determined by the state and this set of standards will be applied to all in Maine. But he, again, is is holding the EPA decision up as an example of going against the Maine Indian Claims Settlement Act. And um, as you've just laid out, that is not your interpretation or the EPA's interpretation, but I wanted to give you a chance to to speak to that as well. Yeah, so he's, um, you know, the EPA decision saying that Maine had the authority to administer water quality statewide um, is directly because of very tough statutory language from the Settlement Act. Um, but Contra- which was has been so controversial as you pointed out these past um, these past years of whether that actually is what the settlement act said exactly so so from the tribe's perspective you know in you what you've also heard all throughout the paper is in I believe mr. Manahan's comment as well was you know the the Penobscot's uh, consumption rates are suspect and 
their mm-hmm. ultimate goal is to overturn the Settlement Act, right? Right. And um, just not true. I mean, did the tribe make an agreement in 1980? Of course it did. Did it? Uh, does it understand that agreement as the state does today? Absolutely not. I mean, we are miles apart on what we believe and, and know the intention of that act was. We believe it's been stretched to suit a state view, and we believe that it's uh, been interpreted to continue to try to make the tribes of Maine wards of the state. And um, so there's a federal law that says quite clearly, never ceded, always retained. And those things that were not explicitly ceded by the tribe are retained by the tribe. And any ambiguity of interpretation within anything to do with Indian country is always to be favored into the tribe's point of view. That's the canon of construction of federal Indian law. Mm -hmm. The state has to argue to get around that, that there is no federal relationship in Maine. Tribes have no rights with the federal government. The tribes only exist as the Maine Indian Land Claim Settlement says they exist. Well, there's a whole other body of who we are, what we are, and kind of where we are, and what those rights are that are set in treaties, that are um, set in federal law, that are... um, set in congressional intent, all of those things um, apply to the tribe. It's just in terms of the land claim itself, a lot of this language is specific to that. And um, so we believe that lawyers have, over the last 35 years, done it so much in terms of saying this is what it means and stretching that intent of what the document actually meant, that we have an unrecognizable settlement act today. And so, you know, to say that the tribe ceded the Penobscot River as part of the main Indian land claim settlement is is just unthinkable. I mean, I cannot imagine. As a matter of fact, we've talked to all the negotiators, and we've talked to people that were intimately involved. The river was never on the table. And actually, they were draft. Well, there, there was a whole host of material I don't really want to uh, get into, but there's a whole host of material that that supports that. So, so yeah, you're right. I mean, the the interpretation of what the Settlement Act means, um, you'll find as many answers to that as people you talk to. And the reason for that is uh, there's a lot of language in there that doesn't suit what the state. So the ambiguity is really created by trying to turn the document into something that it's not. And so, um, so, and I know that doesn't always suit the state's view. And, uh, and for some reason, you know, they have to control every aspect of the tribes and I just don't understand why. And so, um, the settlement act, you know, gave up certain things on our side and gave up certain things on their side. And, But I think what's important is that the Maine Indian Tribal State Commission, which was created in statute to continuously review the effectiveness of the act and the social and economic impacts uh, on tribes, and also to deal with ambiguities within the act, suggests that everybody knew that there was gray area in there, that there was confusion in some areas, and um, and that it would have to be continuously worked over time. But instead of continually working together on this over 35 years, it's been about a litigation um, process every other year since the document was signed. And, you know, the tribe has been on the short end of a lot of those in terms of uh, some state court decisions and also... Um, through legislative actions uh, within state government. So, uh, you know, I really feel like, as we sit here and talk today, that the federal government is not just in the Penobscot case or the Passamaquoddy or Micmac Mousy, but all across the country, you know, the federal government is saying, 
you can't just take anymore. You can't just take a tribe's land. You just can't remove them from their cultural identity. You just can't do those things. It's illegal. It's against federal law. And as the protectors of tribes, with plenary authority within Congress and also with the trust fiduciary relationship within uh, its agencies, we're not going to let it happen. And, uh, and I understand they don't like it, but the reality is is that we could sit down, if we could sit down as sane people and say, what are the concerns, issue by issue, and how do we develop agreements that mitigate those things? Sovereigns do that all the time. But, it, but if you're not willing to recognize the distinct sovereign governments that exist within the state, you can't really get off the starting line with that conversation. So, um, mm-hmm. so we stand ready to have that conversation, um, and we just would encourage Maine people to not, you don't have to take our word for it, but certainly don't take their word for it. Let's, let's have a comprehensive conversation about the status of Indian people in the state of Maine today, the conditions that exist, who's going to take responsibility for those conditions. I will tell you that we will. There is no question about that, and we are. Um, but we have to be able to self-govern to do that. And so if we, so there's this constant struggle for control, and when Maine obtains it, has been shown for over a century, of controlling Maine's rivers, that, you know, our interest is not going to be uh, be taken very seriously. And the condition that existed, um, we're trying to play a part in, in a very a prominent role in not just reducing the effect, but overturning, like I say, over a century of problems. So we're doing the best we can to overcome the conditions within our communities, whether that's public safety, whether it's, uh, you know, economic development, whether it's, you know, our judicial systems, natural resource protection, all of those things. But we're under constant attack and, and interference from from the state, predominantly through the Attorney General's office. And I think that if we have this conversation, I'm confident that Maine people will see that it's not an us versus you thing. It's really all of us have an interest in this, and it's about protecting Maine's heritage, and it's about making sure that um, all people are being respected, including the uh, Native population here in the state of Maine, and, and you know, but the state of Maine has the most Indian territory within its borders, east of the Mississippi, and it's something we should be propping up and being proud of, and figuring out partnerships on how to uh, grow the state together. And I think that, um, you know, Maine's natural resources are its jewel, and it's really its opportunity for the future. And, and I think, um, you know, so we're trying to do everything we can, including. Uh, in the water quality arena with our own standards, with a whole host of things to help with that agenda. But, you know, we can't help that, you know, people within state government get threatened by that, and we can't help that um, there's this constant um, attack for control within all aspects of tribal life. And so, so this decision, for the first time, said there is a federal presence, and you're not just going to do what you want. You have to respect those things. And so, um, again, you know, we couldn't be happier. And I think this has been such an important time for our tribe, you know, both with the fear and and kind of emotion that's around um, the current federal uh, court case and, you know, the CPA issue. And, you know, we're talking about um, implementation of violence against women and getting uh, blocked on that and a whole host of, of. of issues that are really just uh, stresses on the tribe right now. And this was really a breath of fresh air. Anything else that you would like to add? No, I would just like to add that, uh, you know, our doors, we're not a closed society here. Our, our doors are always open. Um, you know, we have over 150 government employees and, and a couple dozen departments and a lot of land. And, and uh, we welcome anyone that wants to come and and see our territory and talk to us about the uh, uh, about the current issues and our perspective on those things and um, hopefully, you know, get a good, um, honest answer and preview of, of kind of uh, where we are and why things 
are fought so heavily here. I think, um, you know, when you look at all the issues out there, whether it's gaming, um, you know, which is a, uh, you know, an equal, equal rights issue, it's really, a, it's really not a slot machine issue for, for me or the tribe. It's really mm-hmm. about, you know, um, why the tribe is continuously left behind on certain issues. And so there's a lot of things that go into uh, the issues beyond what we see on in the paper or in other places. But I think, um, you know, I, I would just offer that to anyone that would like to, um, to come get more educated about the tribe and, and our issues. And we're always happy to do that. And, um, and we would look forward to those conversations. And you referred to if people wanted to find out more information and, doc- and documents on some of the things we were talking about. Is that on the tribe's website or? Some of it is. And, um, and others, you know, you certainly can just, you know, call the tribal office here and uh, we can direct you a call in, in any specific area that you're looking for. And, and again, um, we're more than happy to discuss um, kind of our point of view on these issues and, and do all we can to educate folks on on uh, the importance of coexisting in a mutually respectful way. And and that's really what we stand for. Well, Penobscot Nation Chief Kirk Francis, we thank you very much for taking so much time with us today to talk with us about these very important issues. Thank you so much. We now turn again to the fast-moving and highly controversial bill aimed at opening Maine to metallic mining. DEP rules that were rejected last session are being reintroduced as LD-146, hopscotching over the requirement under the Maine Administrative Procedures Act, MAPA, that the Department of Environmental Protection hold a public hearing on the proposed rule changes before proceeding to the legislature. The Joint Standing Committee on Environment and Natural Resources, however, has scheduled a public hearing on the bill for February 25th, 9 a.m. at the State House. Today we hear part of a presentation given by Nick Bennett, staff scientist for the Natural Resources Council of Maine. So I'll just go through a little bit about mining in general and talk about why we're so worried about having strict mining rules in Maine. We do have some experience in Maine with uh, large-scale mines. This is one of them. This is the Callahan mine in Brooksville. This mine operated between 1968 and 1972. The kind of Um, deposits that we have here in Maine are called sulfide deposits and what that means is the metal you're after copper, zinc, gold, silver is in a matrix of iron sulfide so much the the, most of the material when you mine a site most of what's there is not valuable stuff it's waste products and a rough very rough rule of thumb is that something like 1% of what you're after is there and the rest of the 99 the 99% of the rest of the stuff is waste. So when you're taking a whole lot of stuff out of the ground like that, almost all of it is waste. A very small amount of it is copper or zinc or whatever it is that you're going after. Um, in a really rich deposit, it might be 10% copper. In a bad deposit, it might be half a percent copper, but roughly 1% is usually what you're talking about. Um, so this mine stopped operating in 1972. It operated for four years. It's still not cleaned up. It's a super fun site. Um, this pit has been flooded, so now it's underwater. Uh, this mine is still leaching toxic contaminants into the water. It contaminates the fish and the shellfish around the site. A uh, professor at Dartmouth University just did a study uh, summer before last, and has found that the site is still leaching heavy metals and they're still contaminating the aquatic life uh, in the area. This is the other large scale mine that we've had in Maine, metal mine, it's sometimes called the Care American mine, sometimes called the Black Hawk mine, sometimes called the Blue Hill mine uh, because it was in Blue Hill. This mine was supposed to make, create hundreds of jobs and supply millions of tons of ore Uh, and operate for 20 years. It operated for four years between 1972 and 1977. Never employed more than 100 people. Uh, It shut in 1977. In the mid 90s, DEP did some surveys around this site and it was discovered that it too was leaching toxic metals into the water. And 
there were many years of litigation, like a decade of litigation. There was a responsible party that DEP wasn't able to find at this site and forced them to pay for stabilizing the site, which was completed a couple years ago. So again, it took roughly 30 to 40 years to clean up this site after uh, mining operations had stopped and a lot of litigation costs, which are costs borne by the public. For the previous site, the public is paying for all of the cleanup and main taxpayers pay about a million dollars a year just to keep the band-aids on this site. And we're paying a million bucks a year and they haven't even started the major part of the cleanup 40 years later. It means the companies that ran it disappeared. They no longer exist as legal entities. They go bankrupt, they dissolve, they vanish. It's very typical for mining companies to come in, strip the place, and disappear as legal entities. So, as I said, really this whole issue is, has been started by J.D. Irving and they don't like the old 1991 mining rules that we have in effect now because they think they're too stringent and they won't be able to mine at Bald Mountain, which is a site that they own. And they've driven this whole process to change the statewide regulations so they can drive at Bald Mountain. And so they can mine at Bald Mountain, rather. And um, that's the only mine anybody's ever talking about, but there are a lot of other areas in Maine where there are potential metal deposits. And those areas are all in yellow. So you can see that there's a lot of places in the western mountains where you could potentially find uh, copper, zinc, metal deposits. Um, both sides of Moosehead Lake potentially have deposits. Both sides of Cops Cook Bay potentially have deposits. Uh, there are other areas on the down east coast near MDI. Um, Washington County. So there are a lot of places in the state where you could find, as well as a bunch of places in Central Aristic and Northern Aristic County. Um, there are a lot of places that you can find metal deposits in Maine. So the idea that you're weakening um, mining regulations and Irving says, oh, don't worry, you know, it's just for Bald Mountain, that's baloney. Um, if you weaken the regulations, you open up a lot of the state for mining. And that's just basically what we know about where the uh, sulfide deposits are in Maine, but they could be anywhere. Maine is not that well explored in terms of um, mining geology. So there could be a bunch of other places that we don't even know about. So for that reason, if we're gonna have mining regulations, they need to be strict or we're gonna open up our whole state to something that we're gonna be sorry about. So one of the reasons that we're so scared about what might happen um, with uh, mines in Maine is what has happened at mines in Maine, those, the Blue Hill site and the Callahan site, both very small mines, both compared to the Bald Mountain mine, relatively non-dangerous deposits, not nearly as reactive, not as much sulfur. Um, we're still very worried because of what's happened in other places. And maybe I'll stop there a second, and explain a little bit about the chemistry of mining, as I said, Sulfide deposits are located um, largely, in a, largely in a matrix of iron sulfide. Um, when you t dig up iron sulfide and expose it to air and water, the iron sulfide oxidizes and it makes sulfuric acid. And the sulfuric acid is dangerous for two reasons. One reason is because it's sulfuric acid. And um, when you make sulfuric acid and it leaches into groundwater or surface water, it's toxic to the critters that live there, just by itself. But another huge problem with sulfuric acid is that it causes other heavy metals that are in the deposits to leach out, like mer mercury, cadmium, copper, zinc, all of, and copper and zinc, for example, we don't usually think of those as really toxic metals, but they are incredibly toxic to fish, particularly to uh, salmonids, like brook trout. Brook trout are very sensitive both to acid and to heavy metals like copper and zinc. So once you start this acid mine drainage problem, which is what happens when you dig up iron sulf a bunch of iron sulfide and expose it to air and water and increase the surface to volume ratio by blasting it 
and then you're taking rock to a mill and crushing it and into really fine particles to chemically leach the copper and other metals that you want out of it, you start this reaction called an acid mine drainage reaction and that's where the trouble really starts. I hope I'm making, am I speaking English and yeah. being comprehensible here? Okay. Um, and you know, th this stuff is relatively harmless when it's buried under a whole lot of soil and rock under the ground where it can't be ex exposed to a combination of air and water. When you, when you bring it up to the surface and you, you, know, you take your waste rock, which isn't high in copper or zinc, but is high in iron sulfide, and you put it in a big pile and you've blasted it up, so now you've got chunks of rock exposed to the air and the water, that's where the, the problem starts because now the air and the water get at the rock. It's much more surface area for the air and the water to interact with the rock with and you start getting stuff that's coming off those waste piles in addition to what's called tailings, which is the very, very fine stuff that comes out of a mining mill where you send the big pieces of rock to grind them up and put in vats of chemicals that um, leach out the copper uh, or the zinc or the gold or whatever it is that you might be uh, trying to get. And you usually store those tailings in a big pond. And if the, that pond overflows or the dam that creates the pond breaks, then those tailings can get into the environment. That's a big problem. But even just the waste rock that you take out and you're not milling and crushing up and you're leaving on the ground somewhere, that can be a big problem. We know that's going to be a big problem at Bald Mountain because the consultants that looked at that site for a Swedish mining company that used to own it said, whoa, the waste rock here is really reactive. It's really high in sulfur, like 50% sulfur. And if you just leave this sitting around, it's going to cause big problems. So you need to put this underwater in a pond as quickly as possible. Covering mining waste with water is one way to slow down the acid reaction, but it doesn't stop it because water has oxygen in it too. And it's especially likely to have oxygen in it if it's shallow. And most of these um, tailings ponds are shallow. So. Um, what do we know what metals in particular are? Copper is the biggest one. Yeah. And then there's some gold and some silver, but primarily it's a copper mine or a potential copper mine. If you look at the history of mining, um, there are a lot of examples of disasters. And that's another thing that really worries us. And what the mining industry will tell you is, oh, no, 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 that's a 19th century problem. But we are modern. We know what we're doing now. We don't cause problems anymore. So the Summitville mine actually started in the late 80s. Um, the late 80s, we had computers. We had jet airplanes. I mean, this was not the Middle Ages. This was my modern mining engineering in the 1980s. And this mine was a terrible disaster. It only operated for four years. It was leaching cyanide into the Alamosa River the whole time it was operating. Um, but in 1990, it had a really big spill of cyanide into the river, and it killed 17 miles of the river. It li literally killed everything in the river. Um, this mine uh, has basically been cleaned up on the public dime. It's cost about $200 million so far. It needs a wastewater treatment plant to operate in perpetuity to deal with uh, the wastewater there. It's a very high altitude, so that's expensive. Um, it's difficult to run in the winter, which is a problem we're going to have in Maine, too. The treatment plants don't work as well in the freezing cold weather. Um, ice can get in there and cause problems. So this is not something we want to have happen in Maine. And if it's going to happen, we certainly want uh, companies to pay up front enough money to clean up the site. This company paid, had a, a pitifully small amount of money, and the cleanup has cost hundreds of millions of dollars so far, and will continue to cost a couple million dollars a year in perpetuity to run that wastewater treatment plant, all of which is going to be paid for by taxpayers. And is that an open pit mine? Yeah, that's an open pit mine, open pit gold mine. No. 
There's no mine site anywhere that hasn't caused big environmental problems. There are really four areas in these mining rules that we've been focused on and that we think are the most important areas of the mining rules to change. The first is that the mining rules allow per mines that are so dangerous that they would require perpetual treatment. And perpetual treatment is a bad deal for the taxpayer because no company lasts forever and wastewater treatment plants are very expensive to operate. And if you have to operate a wastewater treatment plant for a thousand years, one of two things is going to happen. Either the public's going to pay to operate it because companies don't last that long, or it's going to stop operating and it's going to cause a disaster. Those are the two possible outcomes there. So our mining regulations need to prohibit mines that would require perpetual treatment. If you can't go in and mine and clean up the site and leave it as something stable, you should not be allowed to do it. The second big problem with the mining rules is that they allow um, infinite pollution of groundwater underneath the mining area. The mining area, as it's defined in the rules, could be very big. Once you start groundwater pollution, it's very, very hard to contain it. And the larger the area you allow to be polluted, the more likely it is to spread very widely. So it's important that the mining rules um, define mining area in as limited a, a way as possible and make sure that the areas where you're going to allow contamination of groundwater are as small as possible. Not, you know, if you have a factory or a mill where you're grinding up the rocks to get the metals out of it and a treatment plant over here, maybe you have a little space around each of those where you allow contamination of the groundwater, but not all of the area in between, which is the way the current rules read. So that's something that we need the legislature to change. And I think it's going to need to be a change in statute, not just a change in rules, because that was one thing we didn't win on when the statute passed in 2012. That definition of mining area was not clear, and it was passed on verbatim into the rules. DEP claims otherwise, but that's how the rules read. Um, the third big problem with the rules is that they have a very bizarre um, way of calculating financial assurance. Financial assurance is the money that mining companies have to pay up front to um, for screw-ups and in case they go bankrupt. And our position is that they should have to pay a worse, the amount of money it would cost to clean up a worst case scenario as verified by a third party. An independent third party engineering firm needs to come in look at the site and say, all right, if there's a collapse of a tailings dam or a massive leak of stuff into groundwater, how much is that going to cost to clean up? That's how much you need to put up front, not $2 million. There's $2 million doesn't get you anything ever at a mining site. No mining site is cheap to clean up. They all cost a fortune to clean up. The mining companies need to put that money up front. And the last big problem is that the mining rules have, as written, allow mines very close to or under both conservation lands. In fact, with many conservation lands and public lands owned by the state, they would allow mines on those lands. And they allow mines under pristine, and next to pristine lakes and class AA and A rivers. There should be buffers between our most treasured areas, class AA, class A rivers, and our great ponds and our public conservation lands, we should not allow mines on them or right next to them. Which That's crazy. Because everywhere. What's that? Which is hard to make to do because there's ponds and lakes everywhere. There are ponds and lakes everywhere, but not as every there aren't class AA ponds rivers everywhere, and there aren't great ponds everywhere. There are wetlands everywhere. But you know, people have their lives invested in their properties on lakes. And the way the rules are written, you can come in and put a mining tunnel under somebody's house. That's not okay. Well, that's like in Texas. You have, when you buy a property, you don't own the mineral rights. It's exactly the same thing here. Exactly. So the legislature needs to be clear about what to do about that. 
and these rules are not. Again, that was Nick Bennett with NRCM. The public hearing before the Joint Committee on Environmental and Natural Resources on LD146 is February 25th at 9 in the morning. And you've been listening to Radioactive on WERU Community Radio. You can listen to this and other locally produced public affairs programming at weru.org.